Seriously, this morning, Zorro. How many of you have got, bought his book so far, Soar? Yeah, there's, we have these resources out here. These are important. He's a world-renowned drummer. Uh, he has recorded with music legends such as Lenny Kravitz, Bobby Brown, New Edition, Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons. He's an author, life coach, ordained minister. I even found out he recorded with Michael Jackson back in the day. And um, so, I mean, this is no small beans. We are blessed to have Zorro here. And he's going, I'm going to introduce him. He's going to do, I believe, a drum solo. And then he's going to speak for us this morning. But listen, I think we need training and equipping in worship. And this is why this is important. Zorro, it's all yours, my friend. God bless you. Over. How are we doing this morning? Yeah. Morning star, how are we? All right, could you guys hear me at all? I, I, I feel like I'm enclosed in that cubicle like I'm completely by myself. Nick, that was for you. I don't know if you enjoyed that. I, I played that for my friend Nick and his wife because they, they like drums. Give it up for Nick and his wife. I felt like I was all by myself up there because, you know, ever since they in invented that glass fishbowl for the drummer to play in, he's gotten lost. <laughs> I don't even know if you could see me out of the car window there or whatever. But uh, I like playing when that thing's open so I could feel the people. So you guys doing all right this morning? It is, uh, it is awesome to be here. I get so excited every time Rick invites me to come back. I don't know why he invites me to come back, but he does, and I'm always grateful that he does, and this particular trip is very special to me because I have to bring my son with me, the first time he's traveled with me uh, on one of these trips. But anyway, I had a fabulous uh, day yesterday, and how many of you uh, got to hear uh, Chris Reed speak last night? Wow, that was amazing, Chris. That was awesome, super uh, revelatory, and super inspiring. I, I, I just... I think what I enjoy most about coming here is just getting a chance to hear all these other great speakers and just hang and be around these generals of God's army because there's an anointing. There's an anointing in this room, in this church, in this area, in this city, and I just like being around it. And every time I come and leave, I feel like I'm different and I change, and so it inspires me. How many were here this yesterday morning when I spoke? Okay, awesome. Well, I'm glad for, for some reason they asked me back, so I've got more, more to share with you today. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, everything that sort of burns in my heart as far as an anointing and a ministry is always to encourage and inspire people to live out God's call on their life. I agree with everything that Chris spoke yesterday. Gosh, if we just, if each one of us just led another person to the Lord and discipled them. But so many Christians don't realize that the visions and dreams that God gives us, he wants us to carry out because they're going to have a great impact on his kingdom. They're going to have a great impact on his people. And so we talk a lot about dreams in this world and in this country. We're big on visions and dreams, but there's a real purpose behind them. And it's not just... God gave me many different visions and dreams as a kid, uh, all of which I've followed through to the very end, and I'm still following other visions and dreams through. But they're not so much for me. They're, the dreams and visions that he gives us are for how we're going to impact the people that are around us and how we're going to bless the community that's around us. So they're really about other people and other outcomes than just our own personal benefit and joy. But I don't know about you, but every dream that God has given me there's a price you pay uh, to fulfill that dream. And I can think of nobody uh, more important than uh, the dreams that Joseph had and how much uh, it ended up costing him to fulfill those dreams. So uh, the future, we're here, this conference is about the vision and about vision for the future. And, uh, Victor Hugo put it this way. He said, the future has many names for the weak it is unattainable. For the fearful, it is the unknown. For the bold, it is opportunity. So we all view the future in different ways. Um, when God gives you a vision for the future personally, um, you can be certain that the enemy will do everything he can to prevent it. Uh, and that's just, that's just something you're gonna have to expect. If God gives you a vision, 
it's, it's gonna, the enemy is going to come against that vision, especially if it's something where it's going to enable a lot of other people to know who he is. So you can expect opposition. A part of his strategy is to bombard you with enough disappointment that you just quit. That's the goal of the enemy. It doesn't matter how that disappointment comes, but uh, he's going to bombard you with it in various ways, and, uh, and, and if you give in to it, then you'll never see the fulfillment of the vision. So I have two questions for you this morning, but you don't have to answer them right now. This is something you should give much thought and prayer to, but the first one is, what do you feel God is calling you to do in this next season of your life? What do you feel God is calling you to do in this next season of your life? You know, Chris gave us a vision of what's what's to come that God's gonna do on the earth, but inside of that huge vision of what's gonna happen, there's a personal thing of where does God want you to be in all of that, and what role does he want you to play through all of that, because you have a role to play. So your question for God is what, what do you feel that God's calling you to do? The second question is, once you answer the first one is, what is preventing you from going after it? What is stopping you? What has been stopping you? These are things only you can answer through the Holy Spirit. But what is, what is, God, what is, what is preventing you from going for it? What are you afraid of? God has things he wants you to inco- accomplish that will enable you to impact his people for his kingdom, but they will not come without a fierce battle. So you have to be prepared to fight. The author James Patterson put it this way. He said, nothing worthwhile happens without conflict. How many of you watch a movie, uh, how many of you would watch a movie like Lord of the Rings if there was no conflict or there's no battles? How many of you would watch Star Wars if there's no battles? How many of you would watch Rocky if there's no battles? We watch things because there's conflict and we want to see people overcome the conflict. And God puts conflict in our life not to, to stop us, but to shape us. To, he's interested in our character becoming different through the conflict. So don't think of conflict as always. There is some things that the enemy tries to do to stop you, but there is just a natural conflict that causes you to grow. And sometimes it's hard to discern which is God just trying to train me and which is the enemy. But the idea is not to quit. Listen to what Isaiah 49.2 says. He says, he made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. So we're like an arrow for the Lord. We're, we're, we're a weapon for God. And I love uh, Psalm 144, one says, blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and fingers for battle. I had a t-shirt once made with that because I just love that. So when I play the drums, I think of, he's, used, he's training my hands for battle because in one way I'm battling on the drums because music is a spiritual thing. It's, I'm worshiping. And so I know when I play, whether I play in a secular environment, a secular song, a Christian environment, a Christian song, it doesn't matter. I'm a warrior on the instrument. So he trains my hands for war and in my case, my fingers for battle. But he does that with all of us. We all know the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis. In Joseph's history, we see something of Christ who was first humbled and then exalted. So if you want to fulfill God's vision for your life, how many want to fulfill God's vision for their life, really? Because if you don't, I don't know why we're here. There's nothing, there's nothing in life worthwhile if you're not pursuing God's vision for your life. Everything is meaningless and pointless unless you're working towards fulfilling the vision that God's given you for life. That's what gives my life uh, substance and, and, uh, and, and joy is knowing I'm pursuing these things. But if you want to fulfill God's vision for your life, you got to be prepared to be humbled. I've had a tremendous amount of, uh, like all of you, a tremendous amount of disappointment in my life. Um, and I'm going to share with you some of those disappointments and how God took me from those disappointments to the destiny that he had for me. The name of my message is going from disappointment to destiny. How many know when Joseph had the vision and dream that his brothers would bow down to him and even the stars and moon would, that, uh, that he, he, would, he had no idea 
what, that was, what he was gonna have to go through to see that vision come to life. But God had a purpose and a plan in that, and it was to redeem and rescue his people during a famine. So there's always a point and purpose for the vision that he gives you. So if you're going to suffer, and you know you're gonna have to be humbled, then at least know the outcome is gonna be something awesome. Something, is, something great is gonna come out on the other side. So you have to refuse to quit. So here are some of the keys to going from disappointment to destiny. How many here have been through something disappointing? If I don't see your hand up, then you're lying. <laughs> or you found some other way to do it that I haven't. Or how many of you are disappointed right now about something happening in your life, right? Disappointments are all around us. So we're not gonna be able to avoid them, so how do we navigate through them? So the first thing is to ask God and some people have never done this. Just ask God to give you a vision for your life. What, 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 say, Lord, give me a vision for my life. What is it that you put me on this earth to do? What is it that you want me to accomplish? And I like how Chris shared it last night. It's true. It's, you know, your, your occupation. Um, uh, how did you put it? Your occupation with your... Uh, exactly. So a lot of times people think like think that ministry is just getting up here and speaking, you know, or that I got to work at a church or I got to do something. Ministry is your life. Ministry is how you go about doing your life wherever you do it. Anybody with this, the gift of speaking can get up here and speak. And that doesn't mean they're actually living any of it out. So you know what I mean? So that's just a gift of an orator. But the bottom line is, the whole world is your ministry. Your ministry is your life and how you do life and everywhere you go. And everywhere you go, you have an opportunity to be a, a light in a dark place. So the, the purpose of your life should be to glorify God wherever you're at, wherever he's got you. You have to be faithful with where he has you now so he can take you to those other places. A lot of times I think people are waiting they're waiting to get that dream job or that dream position before they finally decide to give it their all. It works the other way around. You're faithful in the little things and he puts you in charge of more. So be faithful with whatever job you have right now, whatever uh, influence you have right now. Be faithful with those little things and God will multiply it and God will take you to other places. But look at your ministry as your life, not, not a church, not a, not a service, not a, a small group, but just wherever you go, that's your ministry. So ask God to give you a vision for your life Proverbs 29, 18 says this, where there is no vision, the people perish. John Mason put it this way. He said, it is not the absence of things that makes you unhappy. A lot of people think things are gonna make them happy. Things don't make you happy. It's not the absence of things that make you unhappy. It's the absence of vision because you have to know where, where you're headed. So every January, I, uh, I write out my goals for the coming year. I'm very big on that because I believe God speaks to us and he gives you visions and dreams and they're gonna come in ideas and then you write them down. Can you imagine buildings going up without a blueprint? What, what building could go up without a plan for it? So God gives you visions and dreams and then you have to strategize. So I read and studied that uh, you are 42% more likely to accomplish something if you write it down. Now I did not know this, but ever since I was a little kid, I've been writing down visions and dreams. I, didn't, I never read that when I was young, but I still have a piece of paper from when I was 16 years old. It's a little orange piece of paper. I was working at the county fair and I wrote down, at the time I just started playing the drums, but I wrote down the vision. I said, I wanna become a world renowned drummer. I still have the piece of paper. I said, I wanna be married to the love of my life. I, there were five things I wrote down on that piece of paper. I kept a diary from when I was 10 years old. I was always writing out visions and dreams. And then later when I read that you're 42% more likely to achieve them, um, do the work. I've always taught all my students, I said write down a vision and dream for your life. Ask God to show you in three, way, in three areas. We have a personal life, which is how we thrive in relationships with people. And we have a spiritual life, which is our relationship with God and how we thrive and connect with God. And then we have our vocational life, which is some skill or gifting that he gave us that we're able to make a difference in the world. And we're never gonna be fulfilled unless we're flowing in all three of those areas. Because he didn't make you to just flow in your vocation. 
He didn't make, you know, some people are, are excel in their vocation, but, at, but they suffer in their personal life. They have no personal, they're not thriving in relationships. Some people are thriving in their relationships, but they're not making a difference in the kingdom because they're not using the gifts that God gave them in a vocation. So we're, we're all three of those things, personal, spiritual, and vocational. And so ask God to show you what each one of those looks like and so that you can thrive in all of them. So write out your goals. Every year I write out my goals and maybe there's 50 things I write out. And at the end of the year I look at what did I accomplish for God of those 50 things? And sometimes it's only 10 things, but I guarantee you there wouldn't be 10 if I didn't write the 50. Some things move back from year to year. You write them down and Life gets in the way, and that's not the season God has for that. I've had things that were written down for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and eventually came to pass. I've had things that came to pass in that very year. So some, you do all this by faith because you don't know exactly, you know, you, you sense it in the spirit. I, I think God wants me to do this. And then you just wait it out and see what God has, what, what things move to the top of the plate, right? Here's what Benjamin Mays said. He said, the tragedy in life doesn't lie in not reaching your goals, the tragedy lies in having no goal to reach. Having no goal to reach. Andrew Carnegie said, if you want to be happy, set a goal that commands your thoughts, liberates your energy, and inspires your hopes. Lou Holt said, if you're bored with life, you don't get up every morning with a burning desire to do things, you don't have enough goals. So some of your goals should be like what Chris said, it seems so simple, but so few people do it. Why don't we lead anybody to the Lord? Why don't we disciple anybody? I mean, that's, that's the purpose of why we're here, to make disciples of all men. It's not that hard. You teach them what you've learned. <laughs> what, you all have walked with God to some level, to some degree. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You just have to be willing to share what you know, that Jesus came and set you free, and we should be discipling people. Our goal my goal of my entire life is to reach as many people as I can for the kingdom of God and drag as many people with me as possible to heaven. I want to drag as many people with me to heaven as possible, and I want those who already know Christ, I want to have made some kind of difference in their life that because I lived in this world they gleaned something from me. I inspired them, whether it was something I played, something I wrote, something I spoke, a kind word at an airport. My whole vision with everything God's given me, every platform God has given me is just a tool of which to reach and touch people in some kind of way. So my goal is to touch as many people as humanly possible with my lifespan. All of, you know, life itself is a limited time offer. For a short amount of time, God offers you life. But it's a limited time offer. It expires. It will end at some point. So your goal should be, how can I touch as many people as I can before I expire? Because this will be, the, this will be your only chance to lead people to heaven is while you're down here. This will be your only chance to make a difference. In heaven, it'll be a whole other thing. And it goes by super quickly. It goes by super fast. So don't live with a bunch of regret going, gee, I should, I should have done this. I could have done that. I could have, just do it. You know, I was there yesterday going like, will the Lord give me a, a word for the congregation? And the word that I, I heard, two words, it was the Nike logo. It was, two, it, it was not even the Nike, the Nike logo, it was just do it. I don't even say just do it. I say do it. <laughs> do it. Whatever it is God's calling you to do, just do it. Don't, don't doubt, don't worry, just do it. But that's the, that's the goal of my life. And so everything gets funneled through that is, is what I'm doing. You know, the question to ask yourself every day is whose life is better because I'm alive? Whose life is getting better because I'm here? And everyone can do that. You don't need some platform. You don't need a book. You don't need to be famous. You don't need to be anything but a person who's willing to make a difference. Just by being kind to people, you're already making a difference. So whose life is getting better? Because how are we representatives and ambassadors of Christ if we're not making a positive difference wherever we go? So that's the question I ask myself. That's my, that's my real goal. And everything else is just means of which to accomplish that. Um, all right, so to co commit to the vision that God gives you, 
when you feel God's giving you the vision, and again, it's by faith, because sometimes you, it's hard to discern, is, is this me, or is this the flesh, is this God? But whatever you feel that God's showing you, commit to doing it, whatever it takes, and that takes conviction of the heart. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes said, to reach a port, we must sail, sometimes with the wind, and sometimes against it, but we must not drift or lie at anchor. So just decide to go for it. Uh, a lot of us choose uh, our path out of fear disguised as practicality. So we, we avoid the real dreams that God gave us because we're afraid. So then we choose a different path because we go, well, this, this is more practical. That, that would be too lofty or too whatever because we, we have a shallow perspective of, of ourselves and we realize this might require a lot of work. Don't pursue things just out of practicality. Pursue the things that God has shown you. God is a God of supernatural ability and powers. He causes things to happen that we can't make happen. So this is where you get a chance to build your faith up. If God is showing you something and it looks impossible, go for it. Because he'll do the impossible part. You just have to do the faithful part and work. Here's the part that nobody likes when fulfilling a vision. It's a nasty word. It's called work. (laughs) It's called work. I like how Thomas Edison put it. He goes, uh, opportunity is missed by most people because it comes dressed up in overalls and looks a lot like work. (laughs) Here's a guy who would know. It took him 10,000 experiments for the light bulb to finally stay lit for any length of time, right? So in order to fulfill any vision that God gave you, it's going to require a lot of hard work. And so if you're not willing to work hard, you will never reach your potential and you will never honor God because laziness does not honor God. Hard work does. I guess what I love about Joseph, besides everything about that story, I just love his heart, that even in the end, how the, uh, how, what the devil meant to destroy him and how his, what his brothers used to try to destroy him, he completely forgave them and said, God used all of this to save you, and he loved on his brothers. And I thought, man, how, how many people would never do that? Because once they would get elevated, now it's their chance to get even with their family and all the people who wronged them. Instead, his heart was like, no, it was all good. You meant it for bad, but God turned, and this is all about your heart. But what I love about Joseph is that he, he was a hard worker, and he could not be kept down. He had a spirit of excellence about him that constantly kept raising him up. And so that's what we need to be, people with a spirit of excellence. And you can't be excellent at something without hard work. It's just not possible. God's caused you. He gives us, when we come into this world, we're already born with a billion dollars in our bank account. It's a billion dollars of potential. But you've got to go to the bank. You've got to make the withdrawals. You've got, every day you've got to go, I'm going to withdraw. When I get to the end of my life, I want to be able to tell God I exhausted all the potential that you gave me. You gave me the potential as a drummer, as a speaker, as a teacher, as a writer. It started off as this little seed. Remember, everything that God gives to you, he gives to you in the form of a seed. He doesn't give it to you as a full-grown oak tree. He gives it to you as an acorn. He gives it to you in the form of a seed, but it's a magic seed, because think about it. A farmer takes seeds and plants them into the ground, and if he abides by the principles that God put in nature, magic happens. Something grows from this little seed. You have a whole cornfield. From this little seed, everything comes from a seed, but we never invented the seed. The seed is the miracle part of God. The seed of your potential is a miracle. The fact that you can excel in a certain uh, area and a certain skill predestined by God is magic. He's giving you like, almost like Jack of the Beanstalk. He's giving you magic beans, but you got to put them in the pot. You got to stir them. You got to, you got to abide by the principles, which is you got to, a farmer's got to water the seed. He's got to fertilize the seed. He's got to protect it from the birds of the air that's going to, that are going to come and try to destroy it, which is the doubt, the fear, the unbelief. You have a seed of potential to be excellent in a particular area, but you are responsible to be the farmer and to plow that land and to turn it into more. The whole point, the whole story of the parable of talents is about turning what God gave you into more. 
So don't, th- don't look at other people going, oh, they have so much talent, they have a lot to answer for. You have just as much talent and gifting as anybody else. But are you willing to work hard and to labor? Uh, Amelia, uh, Emil Zola said, he's an artist, uh, a writer, he said, the artist is nothing without the gift, but the gift is nothing without the work. You know, Michelangelo was the same way. It's like, all these people have a gift, but he, one of those quotes he said that I loved, he goes, if people knew how hard I worked to get my mastery, it wouldn't seem so wonderful. So we look at other people and we just think they're more gifted when really they've just worked harder. And the key is to be a person of excellence like Joseph, but the real key is when you get there and when you rise to the top is to not be an arrogant person. And that's the hard part because usually with skill, with a high skill level comes pride and arrogance. And so pride and arrogance are like a street sign that says danger, rocks falling, unsafe crossing. But humility is like a street sign that says safe crossing here. Because if you're humble, like Joseph was, it allows you to bring other people on the path with you. But if you're prideful, it puts out a message that like, oh, I'm super awesome. You can never hope to get what I have. And no one else gets to come with you on the journey. So we want to be people of excellence. We want to be excellent at the thing God gifted us. And we want to, but we want to do that and then maintain humility, and which is what Joseph did. He rose to prominence in Egypt, second in command, yet he was humble and he was forgiving. How many would do that? Um, Mario Andretti, does anybody remember him? He was a race car driver in the 70s. I, I'm a 70s kid, partially 60s, uh, but partially 70s, so I love everything about the 70s. But he was a famous race car driver. He said, desire is the key to motivation, but it's the determination and commitment to an unrelenting pursuit of your goal, a commitment to excellence that will enable you to attain the success you seek. He would know. The other thing that's important when you're trying to fulfill a vision of God is to patiently endure until God fulfills the promise. This is the hard part, is to patiently endure because I'm sure Joseph, he was doing a great job in Potiphar's house. Then of course, you know what happened. He, he wouldn't succumb to Potiphar's wife and then she got mad and he got sent to jail. I'm sure he felt like, wow, I keep doing all the right stuff and I end up in these positions and places, right? How many of us felt that way? You do the right thing and then this happens to you. But he patiently endured. And I talked about it yesterday, but our attitude uh, during our trials is so important and they so much determine what's gonna happen to us. Some things take a long time. Some visions and dreams of God take forever. Uh, Earl Nightingale said this, he goes, "Never never give up on a dream just because of the time it will take to accomplish it. The time will pass away. Five years from now, it'll be five years from now, no matter what we do or don't do. The time is going to pass. So I always tell myself, it may as well pass while I'm slowly inching towards the vision or dream that God gave me. Right? It may, it's going to pass anyway. If you do something or you do nothing, the time is going to pass. Let it pass with slow progress. What does it say? The... the the, the, the snail reached the ark by perseverance and patience, <laughs> right? Can you imagine a snail walking towards the ark? Like, so that's how you gotta go. You know what? I'm moving forward. That's all that matters. Ralph Waldo Emerson said this. He said, adopt the pace of nature. Her secret is patience. Adopt the pace of nature. Her secret is patience. Hey, I would rather die with 10 dreams that I wasn't able to fulfill, but I may have fulfilled 80 other dreams. In other words, I'd rather, Walt Disney died and he had the dream of Disneyland that had not yet, a Disney world that had not yet been fully realized. But he had that dream in his heart and eventually Disney World came and he died with those plans in his hand, I think, and he, he had the maps all over, he was still. So I'd rather, I'd rather die with unfinished dreams but having fulfilled some because I had dreams. You know, we may not fulfill every single thing, but hey, I wanna die in faith knowing, Lord, I was still pursuing that when you took me out. And some of those things we build are for the next generation. We live in a society where we want to fill everything right now. We want to experience everything right now. We want the pleasure right now. We want the reward. We want the accolades right now. 
you got to think back to the old days when people would build a church and it might take 400 years to build. Maybe all you did was the stained glass windows. Maybe you all did, all you did was the, the foundation and you knew another generation would come after you and do that. We have to think about the things that we're building here are going to impact future generations. If you guys fulfill the will of God and you impact the people around you, who knows what destinies you're changing. If you, if you turn one man to turn to God and he becomes a better father, you've changed future generations until Jesus comes back because one man got his act together. Now he's raised better kids that found out about the Lord. Now he's become a responsible father. So every little change you make in somebody has eternal implications. So don't look at anything as, well, I didn't, preached to a million people like Billy Graham or I didn't I wasn't a war hero or I wasn't a famous writer it doesn't matter be a faithful person Theodore Roosevelt said it is better to be faithful than to be famous just be faithful to the things of God the other thing is to be persistent learn to move past rejection and disappointment and stay on the path that God has set before you remember Jesus was rejected. Every great servant of God was rejected. So why are we so crazy to think that we're somehow going to be able to avoid being rejected in this world while pursuing the visions of God? All of God's great men and women were rejected by society. So don't let that, you know, Bill Burke said this, adversity is the given in life. Character is built or crushed by our response to it. General George S. Patton said this, I don't measure a man's success by how high he climbs, but how high he bounces when he hits the bottom. Right? That's, I mean, anybody can praise the Lord when they're prospering. That's easy to do. Anybody can be thankful when everything's going good. But what do you like when the bottom totally falls out? Because it will fall out. It's going to fall out for all of us at some point. But what do you, what do you like? What, are you able to praise God then? Are you able to thank God then? Are you going to be patient? And then St. Catherine of Siena said this, nothing great is ever achieved without much enduring. You have to endure, people. So whatever God's vision is for you, endure. The next thing is to reassess, recalibrate, and retool. So there's many times God will give you a vision for something and you'll, you'll attempt it. It could be a business. It could be, in my case, I'll share a story. I wrote a book. It's not out there today. My, my book Soar is out there, but I wrote a book before Soar called The Big Gig. It's a 440-page book, a vision that God gave me. Uh, it's called The Big Gig, Big Picture Thinking for Success. And it was a book that I wrote. It was actually the book I was looking for when I was 18. It was uh, when I was 18 trying to become a musician. I didn't know how it all worked. And I, and I wanted to read a book from a musician who had made it. Like, and when I say a musician, we're, I'm, I'm called a side man. So a side man or a side woman are the players that can play with any band. Any group will hire a musician. So the Beatles is a band, right? It's four guys in the band. But if the Beatles had an additional player, they would hire a side man. They hired once a guy named Billy Preston to pay, play keyboards. So a side man is an independent musician. So I couldn't find any books on that when I was growing up and I was in LA trying to figure out how, how does this industry work? And I was so frustrated because there was nothing about the, the business of being a musician and how one goes about uh, getting gigs and how you develop your skills. And so I was so frustrated that I said, one day, you know, when I make it, because I was always a dreamer, so one day when I make it, I'm going to write a book for other people so they can not be as frustrated as I was to show them. Well, I, I had to live it out for 40 years or 30 some years, but I eventually wrote that book God gave me the vision. It actually, so some of these visions God gives us start, start off really small, and that's what you have to remember. It actually started in 1985. I wrote a little article in a fan magazine. I used to play with a group called the New Edition back in the 80s, and they were a very famous R&B group in the style of the Jackson 5. And So I was a bit of a teen star. I was in the teen magazines every week. I had my posters in there. And, and so they asked me, hey, could you write an article for the magazine about show business because I was getting all this fan mail. Hey, how did you make it and all this? And so I said, okay, I'll do that. So I wrote an article. It was called Zorro's Show Business Tips. It was like three pages. I was only like 21 or whatever. It's like three pages long. But when I look back on my life, I go, that was the blueprint 
for what became a 440-page book. That was the structure of the whole thing and how it all started. And I go, it started with just being faithful to writing a little article. I never had any writing training. I never went to school for writing. I had the desire to write. And I guess you could say God gave me the gift of writing. Again, it came in a small seed. I had to develop it. So over those 30-some years, I wrote the book, and then I remember uh, trying to get it published around 2007, and I was rejected by every publisher out there. And I'm going, well, Lord, you gave me this vision. You gave me this dream. I know this is from you. How, how is this ever going to happen? You know, you get frustrated. You get disappointed. So I never quit. I put it on the shelf. I said, Lord, I know in your timing this will happen, even though I'm being rejected by everybody in your timing. So I, I put it on the shelf, and I worked on other goals and other visions. And then I came back and revisited a couple years later. And when I read it, I was like, I'm so much of a better writer now. And I, I rewrote the entire thing, and it became like a 440-page book. Then I found a publisher who absolutely loved it. The book went around the world. It exploded. It became the industry standard for all musicians. And the, the great thing is all the publishers that turned me down, uh, God was preventing, and this is uh, for you. So sometimes God blocks things from you because he actually does have something better. And I know it can sound like a cliche, but so in God's case, a lot of times it's true. He'll block something that you see is a blessing that you want, but it's because you don't see that that's not the thing. So if I would have got published by any of those publishers, the book would have changed a lot. The publisher that ended up publishing it they were not a Christian publisher. They were a secular publisher that did a lot of music instructional books. But one of the things the, the main editor said, he goes, I like all your spiritual stuff. He goes, I want you to keep all your stuff about God and all your stuff because people need that. And he wasn't even a believer, but he was drawn to the light of those things that I wrote in the book. So that publisher allowed me to write everything that I wanted to write without holding anything back. So I wouldn't say that it was a Christian book, but it was clear that my Christian principles were in that book, and anybody with a brain would go, this guy's a believer. But uh, any other publisher would have cut all that out. So God knows what he's doing. So I waited, and I persevered, and the whole point was what? so I could have a book out to see how wonderful I am? No, because the book impacted tons of people around the world. And tons of people would come up to me and say, I read your book, The Big Gig, and they said, now I really see the whole big picture. Because the whole big picture was everything, not just becoming a successful musician, but be becoming a good father, becoming a good person, and seeing your life itself is the big gig. Not the gig itself, but your life, the sum parts of your life is the big gig. It's your life. So anyway, I want to encourage you with that because I was rejected by so many uh, publishers and so many times, but I, this is the part about retooling, reassessing, recalibrating. So sometimes we'll get a vision and we'll get, we'll get disappointed because people didn't buy the first version of it, and then we'll just quit instead of going, well, God, what do I need to do to retool this thing? Most of the successful people in business will tell you they started many other businesses that failed first. Many businesses that failed, and then the sixth business finally took off, right? So you have to be willing to go back to the drawing board with God and go, how do I make this better? How do I retool? How do I reassess what I've originally started so that I, so that I can make it what it is? This is the work part. This is the part where you've got to humble yourself, and this is the part when I, when I looked at my manuscript, I'm like, I'm better now. This would be a lot of work, but I'm willing to do it. Is that helping anybody besides me? <laughs> it's helping me. <laughs> um, C.S. Lewis put it this way. He said, hardship often prepares an ordinary person for an extraordinary destiny. And uh, Thomas Edison said, good fortune is what happens when opportunity meets planning. And Martin Luther King put it this way, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. The key to all this is a little bit of what I talked about yesterday, which is to stay encouraged. Do whatever you have to do to stay optimistic and speak a positive confession. Whatever you got to do, find a way to stay positive and encouraged. For me, again, like I said yesterday, I, 
I do it a lot in reading. I think stories are one of the most important things on this earth. Um, there's, a, there's a saying here it's from an author. It says, after nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the thing we need most in this world. So we've always heard, we've always heard that term, you know, mankind lives off food, clothing, and shelter, right? That's not true. The three of those things we do live off of, mankind lives off of story. That is the fourth thing. What do you think the Bible is except a book of stories that helps us to make sense of why we're here, who made us, where we're going, what this is all about? From the beginning of man's creation, we have been storytellers, sharing stories to the next generation. You see them, writings on the wall and, 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 and the Egypt times. We are storytellers. Why do we need those stories? Why am I telling you my stories? I don't know anybody else's story, so I can only tell you my story. But we, we and, and the stories that I've read of other people, what do they do? They inspire me. They encourage me not to give up because I go, this is what happened to Joseph all these years ago. And look, he kept his heart right, and look what happened. So, yes, we need food, clothing, and shelter, but we cannot survive without story. Story is how we make sense of humanity. That's why we buy books. That's why we watch movies. That's why we listen to podcasts. And the things that you'll remember the most in any of my messages will be the few little stories I shared. You'll forget all these principles in a month. But when I go hear somebody speak, I remember the stories. And we live for story. So find whatever story you need to find to keep yourself motivated during, during the times of great disappointment. Because if you do that, you'll be able to keep going. And there's a time where you're gonna have to let different people go in order to fulfill God's vision for your life. There will be people that will help you and there will be people that will hold you back. And you'll be very disappointed in some of the people that you thought were going to help you, and they weren't able to. And I'm going to read you exactly what, what I'm saying here. Be willing to let people go. There are people who come into your life sometimes to be there for a season. They weren't meant to be there always. Sometimes we find ourselves hooked up with people that we think are there for a lifetime, but they're only supposed to be there for a season. There are people who come into your life like boosters for a rocket. If you ever watch a rocket go into space, the boosters fall off when it reaches a certain altitude. Some people are not equipped to handle the altitudes you are going to. So don't be afraid when they fall off. They are not bad people. They just couldn't go where you're going. So, so many times people get disappointed in the people that are around them that weren't able to carry you all the way. You thought for sure I relied on this person. They let me down. God will always have somebody else or something else if you keep pursuing him to, to, to elevate you. But some people can only help you get so far in life. And some people are just like Joseph's brothers. They're jealous of the vision you carry. They don't want to see it come to pass. They don't want to see you. I was sharing this with Chris last night. Sadly, in the church, I've met so many people in, in being in ministry for about 30 years. I've met so many people that... They don't really have great hearts. They don't want to see you prosper if somehow you pass them in some way. And you go, wow. But you're, it's, it's, it's all comes down to insecurity, right? And, and, and a self-centered heart. And it's, when I meet somebody who, uh, with a pure heart that wants to, wants to see you reach your potential and be everything, you know who your friends are when they celebrate your victories, but there are people, it's like that old song from the 70s, smiling faces. Sometimes they lie, they don't tell the truth. They pretend to be your friend and, and, and they're patting you on the back but they're trying to just hold you back, you know? So you have to be prepared. There are people who don't want to see you become everything that God wants you to be. And some of those people, you have to let go. And in my case, I've had a lot of those people and I just, I forgive them. I just go, you know what, Lord? I, I forgive them. But I don't want to be that kind of person I, I've had thousands of drum students in my career as a drummer, and I want to see each one of them prosper. I want to see each one of them get a big gig. I want to see them go further than me, and I have lots of students that have, and so I champion them, and when, they, when they're on TV, they do something great, I send them a text and say, I'm so proud of you. I'm so, so happy for you, and it feels good. It feels good to, to pass it on to like the next generation, right? 
Whatever, whatever, you don't get, whatever love you don't give away while you're on this planet is gonna die with you. And whatever knowledge you don't give away, whatever encouragement you don't give away will die with you. So give it all away. Give it all away. All right, I'm getting closer to wrapping it up. I prayed God would give me the words this morning. Uh, many disappointments in my life, okay? Um, but every disappointment in my life, God has turned into a victory in time. The first disappointment started at six months of age when my father deserted me. And so uh, my father left me for dead, actually said I was dead, uh, it was a lie. But at any rate, so that causes a lot of uh, hurt in a child. Uh, many of you experience that, uh, either a mother or a father or whatever. But so what the enemy meant to destroy me only made, only made me into a better father because what the rejection I felt through my childhood of sending my father letters after letters, I never met him, but I kept sending him letters and he never responded. It sent a deep spear of rejection in me, but God used that and turned that around and he's gonna do the same in your life if you allow him. So whatever's the greatest pain in your life will be your greatest strength of your ministry. Whatever you have endured, whatever you have overcome, becomes the tool of which God uses to, to place empathy and compassion in you. Because of, of growing up fatherless, my desire was one day I want to become a great father. I want, I want my kids to feel the love that I never felt. And that father's heart transcended into all of my ministry. So everywhere I've traveled in the world, I have the father's heart, which is to help people, to encourage people, to inspire. And I've done it with thousands of students in teaching and doing drum clinics and drum camps around the world and Christian conferences. But that came from that disappointment. So the very thing that the enemy tr is trying to use to crush you if you allow God, that becomes your that becomes your point of strength. And I was I've been uh, I was married when I was younger, and that marriage ended in divorce. I never wanted to divorce, but my wife at the time we were both very young, so there's that part. But she had an affair and um, and then announced that she didn't want to be married to me anymore. And it was a heartbreaking, crushing blow because. I, I, I wanted to be married forever because I grew up in a broken home and I was like, I, I never want to be one of those guys who's divorced. I want to marry somebody and then be with them forever. But that wasn't what happened. But now I've been married for 27 years. I made a mistake the first time. Yeah, I've been married for 27 years. And uh, so God is the God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances, ad infinitum, right? So everything that the devil meant to destroy destroy me with, God turned into something that was more powerful and more useful. And I say that because everybody in this room has disappointment. Everybody in this room has heartbreak. Everybody in this room has had unrighteous things happen to them. Things that were unfair, things you didn't deserve, things that just, you know, and this is why I, when, I, when I'm ministering to people that don't know the Lord, you know, I, I, I always tell them, you know, God doesn't make any make people do bad things to you. I never blamed I never blamed God for my father abandoning me because I realized he did that all on his own. That's what sin is. When your life is not surrendered to God, you're only capable of bad, evil, and selfishness. So I never blamed God for any of the disappointments in my life. I never raised my fist at him. I, I realized it's just the world. It's a fallen place. It's filled with sin. It's filled with broken people. And they do that all on their own. So let let all of that hurt of your past go. I don't know how many people in here are blaming God for things that happened to them at certain points, but it's never him. He doesn't cause those things to happen, but he will use them for his good, even though he didn't cause them to happen, if you allow him in the soil of your heart. If you allow him in there, even the worst thing that's happened to you will, will, be, will make you strong and will make you relatable to other people, and more than anything, it will give you empathy for other people. Because honestly, we don't care about people until we've gone through something. We're all very self-centered creatures as human beings, and it's only when you suffer and you struggle and you go, go through something do you then begin to have compassion and empathy for other people because you know what it feels like. I remember when people would say, oh, I lost my dad or my mom or my grandmother and all that, and I would go, oh, I'm so sorry. But I really wasn't that sorry because 
nothing like that had ever happened to me. I was sorry as I could be without that understanding, but it wasn't until I lost my own mother that I knew the severe pain of, of losing the one you love most. After that, when somebody said I lost my father and mother, I was like, come here, I give a hug. I understand, but I promise you it will get better. Now I had empathy. But before that, it, it was just courteous words we all say. Oh, I'm sorry, so sorry to hear that. So just remember that God is a God who will use everything in your life that, that the enemy has tried to destroy you with, like he did with Joseph. He used all of that to rise Joseph to prominence to save the children of Israel, which eventually that lineage from Joseph led to Jesus. So that's why he's one of my favorite heroes because he endured he had a vision. The vision made his brothers mad. I've shared things with my own family, and sometimes, you know, the people that you love most are the ones that try to keep you down. You know, and you go, man, I want you to be proud of me. I want you to be happy that I did. And a lot of times they're not. And that's not, you know, that's not just my family. That's just all family, right? Don't let that hang you up. There'll be a few people cheering you on along the, the road to life. The main thing is you gotta learn to cheer for yourself. Not in a selfish, arrogant way, but in the way that Joseph must have had to encourage himself and how David had to encourage himself when he was in the cave when Saul was after him. The Bible says David learned to encourage himself in the Lord. Sometimes no one is cheering you on towards this vision. And you gotta learn to cheer yourself on because you gotta learn that God's cheering you on. And if God's cheering you on, then it's okay to cheer yourself on. It's not like arrogant self-love, but like, hey, my son is here. He knows, he knows that I love him. I love him when he's being good, and I love him if he's being not so good. I enjoy him more if he's being good, but I don't stop loving him. So, you know, so the bottom line is the Lord loves us through all of it. All right, I'm going to wind it up. I love how when I bring the plane in on time for a landing... Because again, I told you I was a drummer, I gotta do things on time, I gotta, I gotta abide by the time I'm given. Lastly, trust in God for his outcome and his timing. Trust in God for his outcome and his timing. Release what you have no control over to God. Joseph was in prison and he trusted God. Um, the last thing I'm gonna share with you is, uh, and Rick knows, I'm gonna share the story as quickly as I can. So. You guys know I wrote a book called Soar. I told you about the big gig, and Soar is a motivational book on how to live out God's dream for your life. But God gave me another vision many years ago, and the vision was to write a memoir of my life. So Soar has some of my personal stories in it, but a memoir is a much harder, complex type of book to write. So I didn't think I could do it, and I wasn't, and originally didn't intend to write it. But anyway, to make a long story short, God gave me this vision of writing uh, my story, and Rick knows my story very well. I shared it here a few years ago, uh, but I'm not going to share it now. But anyway, it's a pretty riveting story. It's it's a it's a story kind of in the in the in the mold of a Rudy Rocky Blindside meets Forrest Gump. It's an incredible story of just what God did in my life. And so I've always had this vision to write it out. So anyway, I've been working on it for the last 15 years. It was the vision God gave me. He gave it to me in many different forms. And he also gave me the vision for a movie and a Netflix story that's based on my book. Anyway, so I've been working on it for 15 years. I've been rejected over 100 times between publishers, agents, and the marketing teams at uh, publishing houses that did want the book, but the marketing team would turn it down. And I was like, Lord, I've been toiling and laboring. I've worked on this. I've rewritten it a thousand times. And finally, a year and a half ago, I was like, Lord, I reached the same place I did with the big gig. I said, I can do no more. I've done everything you've asked me to do. I've knocked on every door, but I can't make them open. I'm not mad at you. I trust you and your timing. I'm just going to put this on the shelf for you. I'm not quitting. I'm just waiting on you. So I waited for like about a year and a half and finally God opened a door and brought me an agent and two weeks ago I signed the publishing deal for this book that I've been waiting for 15 years. And the only reason I share that is because you have dreams like that yourself. I, could he have done it 15 years ago? Yeah, but I can tell you this. His timing is always perfect. It would never be the book that it is now because in those 15 years, 
I grew and matured, and I was able to be more vulnerable and truthful than I would at 60 than I would at 45. And you have more perspective the older you get. And I, and I worked on the craft of writing over that whole time. So I turned into a completely different writer. Uh, so when I talk about the hard work, I, I know what I'm talking about. I, and when I talk about things that you don't think you can do, I know what I'm talking about. You're that way too. There's things you think you can't do, but you can. So go for it. Wait on God's timing. And what's the whole point of this? When this book comes out, it is a God story, but it's not written like a Christian book. It's just written like a book. So it's going to reach all people all around the world. But clearly God is in the story, but it's not written with a bunch of Christianese. I'm not trying to convert people. The story will do that. The story, your life story will be what converts people. You don't have to keep preaching to them. It's like St. Francis of Assisi said, by all means, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Live it, and people will see it. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it, and I thank you guys for allowing me to share this uh, message with you this morning. <laughs>